Hi everyone, my name's Dan Draper and welcome to my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you hit that like, subscribe and turn on all notifications to keep up to date with the content that I'm gonna be putting out, including my podcast. Let's get into the videos. Hi everyone and welcome back to the Dan Draper podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. I've got a really exciting guest for you today, which I'm really excited about. But I also want to say a massive thank you to my brand new sponsor, Beda, who are a unique mental health and suicide prevention charity. And you can find their cookbook on the website and there's so many amazing uh, recipes in there. I've done so much cooking out of it. So make sure that you check them out. So today's guest is an incredible ambassador for mental health, but also we're going to be talking about his experiences with chronic pain and how that infe- uh, affected him. So Mr. Sean Bryant, would you like to introduce yourself, sir? Hey man, thanks for having me on. I uh, really appreciate it. Very excited. Um, so yeah, my name's Sean Bryant. I'm, I'm 27. I'm originally from Brighton, but I grew up in Hertfordshire, actually back in Brighton now, um, as of a few weeks ago. Um, my background's mainly in sort of marketing and sales. Um, I currently run my own wellness business. Um, and yeah, I'm keen to uh, share my experiences with you about chronic pain and sort of what I've been through over the last few years. And yeah, hopefully it can spread a bit of positivity and, and maybe even help those who have been through something similar or maybe are going through something similar. Yeah, mate, I just want to say again, a massive thank you for coming on. I really do appreciate it. So, uh, so how's things then, mate? How's, uh, how's Brighton at the minute? Yeah, it's good. It's actually really sunny today. Um, yeah, it's so nice being down by the sea. Um, I feel like my mental health improved, like the minute we came down. Um, mm. It's just nice being able to go out for different walks and not being stuck in the same place. Um, been out to the beach a lot to watch the sunset um especially you know after like a a long hard day grinding um yeah it's nice to be able to do that yeah and I know yeah you're in Clapham aren't you I am mate yeah I'm in uh, I'm in London so uh yeah it's uh it's nice yeah to be fair it's uh it was snowing yesterday I mean London snow you know it's uh it's not going to be the full thing but um no it was it's been lovely mate yeah it's obviously cold but it's really bright today uh, really, really bright, especially with with all the uh, snow on the rooftops and stuff. So yeah, I'm nice. gonna gonna go out for a walk today. I think <laughs> get good, out and good. about, get my it's, mental health sorted because this series two prep is is done now. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, it looks like you've been uh, slogging it out, mate. Fair play. Yeah, absolutely. It's quite man. deceiving, isn't it? The um, the brightness of the winter days when you wake up mm. and it is nice and sunny outside. You think, oh. And then you realise, actually, no, it's really cold and it's probably snowing or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a killer. Oh, mate. But um, yeah, as I said, mate, thank you so much for coming on again. So let's get into it, mate. Where is it, you know, that all your uh, mental health uh, struggles began? You know, when where did it all start for you? So, yeah, um, I'm 27 now. Uh, when I was 21, 22, um, I moved up to London to, to work, actually not far from where you are in Stockwell. Um, and at the time I was experiencing really bad pains, um, in like my legs and my hips. Um, and I was on quite a strong dose of antidepressants because the pain was just wearing me down. Um, and in general, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life. I'd always known that I wanted to run my own business and be creative, um, but in general, I just wasn't happy. And, and the pain, the chronic pain that I was experiencing was was affecting my life in quite a big way. Um, so let me backtrack slightly. That was when I was in my sort of early 20s. When I was in my mid to late teens, um, I started getting like growing pains, you know, like normal growing pains. A lot of people get them anyway. It's quite, um, quite normal for people that shoot up quite fast, which I did. I grew quite tall in about a year. Um, and I went to the doctors and everything. I actually had an MRI scan, you know, like when you go into the tube um, yeah. and they like sort of scan your your joints and your muscles and everything like that. Um, and they said everything looked OK. Um, thought I just had um, growing pains, basically. Um, so I kept on living my life. This is 16, 17, playing lots of sport. I've always been a big footballer. Uh, loved playing golf and tennis and going for runs and, and everything like that. Um, but the pain got progressively worse over over a, a number of years. Um, and 
I tried to find a solution. I, I went to see the doc. I went to see various doctors, really. Um, but went to see some chiropractors, osteopaths, that kind of thing to try and find the solution. Um, and the pain was getting progressively worse, as I just said, um, to the point where I couldn't play football anymore. Um, it was affecting my life a lot on the day to day. Um, and I just wasn't in a good place. And I didn't know what the answer was as to why I was in pain. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, my lowest point really was probably like in my early 20s. Um, yeah. Yeah. And mate, I can only I can only imagine, you know, how that would have affected you with the chronic pain, because I mean, you know, we all grew up with with things like growing pains and stuff like that. But for you to be in such a position that, you know, you had to go through all of that. I mean, how did the pain, uh, the, sorry, how did the pain affect your day to day life? What is it that, you know, was was easy beforehand that made it kind of a bit harder once the pain had, was going through. And I know that you, we're going to talk a bit more about what happened during your, um, you know, your, your pain process. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, it didn't affect me in the terms of like, I wasn't like noticeably limping or th- this is the whole thing people have said to me that they, they didn't realize that I, that I had an issue. Um, but it's like with any sort of mental health issue, it's like an invisible pain. Um, and they're the worst because you're experiencing it and you're going through it, but no one else can see it. And unless you speak about it, um, no one can sort of be there to like give you a bit of guidance and stuff like that. Um, so the pain was affecting me more and more on a day to day basis, purely because it was something that I was dealing with internally and people didn't really get it. Um, I've always been sort of very like happy go lucky, lots of energy, like I've loved socializing. Um, but it really began to affect like my confidence in public um, and sort of turned me from, yeah, this really sort of confident, like fearless person that I was in my in my late teens um, into like a bit of a shell um, because I was dealing with this this issue sort of, you know, behind closed doors that people didn't really know about. Um, and it was seeping into like my everyday life, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely, mate. And as I said, I can only imagine how it how it would have affected you at that point. So you mentioned earlier about your, you know, your lowest point. What would you say that that, that was? What would you say would was the point that you were like, actually, you know, like not only now is it that I need to get help for physically, but mentally, where would you say that that point was that eureka moment, if you like? Yeah, um, I'd say it was just before I moved to London um, a a few years ago. Um, I was back living down in Brighton with my dad um, and I'd been to see a few different people about the pain issue. I was still playing sports um, at the time, but um, it came to a point where I couldn't really play football anymore because during like games and training and stuff, I was fine, but I'd be in like really like severe pain for like two or three days later. Like my, my joints and my like legs and hips would like seize up and I would, yeah, I was just in really bad pain. Um, I went to see one of the hip specialists in, um, Brighton, um, had a couple of x-rays. Um, and they basically said to me, look, this is the issue. You're, basically the sort my legs had sort of grown too far into the like the hip like the hip socket essentially Hmm. so you know it's like obviously a ball and socket my legs were like quite tight in there and that's when I realized that was basically the issue is all the tightness and the pain and uh the lack of mobility was the issue um and I said to him well what's the solution you know I, I need a solution for this I'm in my early 20s I can't you know I can't live like this this is meant to be you know, I meant to go and be going into my golden years soon, um, sort of thing. Uh, And he said, well, we don't operate or there's no real solution for people your age. Um, You're basically just going to have to to live with it. And, you know, you can get, um, you can have an operation later in life in like 15, 20 years. Um, And at that point, after, you know, being through, being in pain for so many years, not being able to play sport and it grating away at my mental health, um, I was just in, in, in such a bad place and I was on uh, sertraline, which is something we'll talk about in a bit, uh, which is an antidepressant um, to manage my anxiety about the whole thing. 
So I think it was when I didn't have an answer and I was, that was at my lowest point where there was no solution to the issue. The only solution was there is no solution, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think that the thing is as well, you know, we you mentioned there about going to hospital and then you, you went to a specialist, didn't you? You went to a specialist in London. Um, that and they was were after able... this, yeah. Yeah. So t- just tell us a bit about that as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so as I said, what I just explained was when I was living in Brighton, I moved up to London. Um, I was living with my sister, actually, my uh, older sister um, and her boyfriend. And she was seeing the sort of situation I was in and how my pain was uh, affecting me. And she encouraged me to, along with my mum, actually, she encouraged me to start the process again in terms of going to see a doctor, um, trying to see a specialist up in London and seeing if I could find a solution to the whole thing. Um, So that's what I did. Um, Went to um, St. Thomas's uh, Hospital in London, had a CAT scan. and then saw the top hip, uh, top hip surgeon in London um, and basically said this, he said, this was the issue. My cartilage had like worn away in my hips um, and I was basically like bone on bone. So that's what, that's where all the, the pain came from and the lack of mobility and, um, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and he said, it's very rare, but we, we do operate on people in their 20s and um, and he, he offered me I could either have a double hip replacement um, or, like the previous guy had said, wait 15, 20 years, not have the operation, deal with the pain, and it will get worse and worse and worse. And then I'll have the operation later in life. Um, and I was kind of like, I was at that time, I was still dealing with like my mental health issues. I was still on a higher dose of antidepressants to deal with like the pain and like the anxiety around it and stuff. Um, and it took me a long while to, to sort of assess what the right thing to do was. I think it took me about six months to be honest, because obviously that's quite a big decision. I didn't realize how big a decision it actually was in terms of like the aftermath of the operation. Um, but I made the decision to go for it. Um, so in October 2018, yeah, I think it was October 2018, um, I had the operation uh, at Guy's Hospital in London. Yeah. And again, mate, as I said, I can only imagine. But, you know, we I know that we spoke off air. And, you know, one question that I wanted to ask you as well is post-operation you know, how, how was the recovery after that for you? I mean, you know, there's, there's one point that we, when we spoke before that you said you had to learn to walk again. Yeah. So I was in hospital for, for about a week after, I think it was about seven days. Um, when I woke up, I, so I had, a, had to have an epidural in my spine to sort of like essentially paralyze my legs. Um, and it took, it took nearly sort of two days for me to to get any um, sort of sensation back in my legs again. Um, And during that time in hospital, I had to use, (laughs) it felt very strange and sort of, not degrading is the wrong word, but um, I felt like useless in a sense, because I had to use like a Zimmer frame to to like, they had to help me like get my legs out of bed. And then I had no um, no strength in my legs, no energy, and I had to use a Zimmer frame to get around and stuff like that. Um, and then had an ambulance take me from hospital back to my mum's house in Hertfordshire, um, and I was bed bound for about six weeks. My parents had to, you know, help me like get to the bathroom and stuff like that. Um, it was pretty savage. Um, and then I was on crutches, I think, for about six months, five six months. Um, and as you just said, yeah, I had to really learn to walk again and, and strengthen my legs um, and let my body recover. Um, but yeah, it was it was a horrible experience. I didn't realise how how sort of savage it was it was going to be. Really, um, I think one of the worst one of the worst things was you go from being so kind of like energetic and like happy about life, and then all of a sudden overnight people are having to help you like just go to the bathroom and like do like simple things like get your like boxes and socks on and you're you're Mm. you're quite helpless um so looking back now that was that was tough um and I'm, I'm glad that I'm as far away as possible from that from that period 
Yeah. Yeah, mate, I I'm over the moon for you as well because that's a that's a hell of an ordeal, especially in your twenties as well. It it's it's crazy. And you know, one thing that really kind of shone out for me there is that, you know, people can make jokes about someone who's older. I know that I'm in my thirties now. Uh, so people say, you know, you're getting on a bit, you know, come on, granddad, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, for someone in their 20s to be, like you said there, needing the assistance of a Zimmerframe and things like that mentally would have been crazy for me. Like, I, I, I don't know how I would have been able to do that. Because I think, you know, the way that we we grew up and the way that society portrays things like Zimmerframes and assistance and things like that is that you're just for someone of, of an older generation but yeah yeah it's it, it's crazy man that you went through that so I, i'm i'm glad i'm glad that you're out the other side mate i really am but you Thank mentioned you. i appreciate that you mentioned earlier um about you know taking medication for your mental health and you know you mentioned there about antidepressants so tell us a bit more about that and then i'm going to ask you a follow-up question on it as well that's really key yeah, absolutely. Um, I first started taking um, sertraline when I was, I would say, 21, 2021. Um, and I just, this was back when I was living in Brighton um, after I left college and everything like that. Um, I was away from all my friends up in Hertfordshire. I think I just split up with um, with a girlfriend. Um, I was dealing with the pain in my legs and stuff like that. Um, and one thing I didn't kind of realise before I started taking them, and, and this is the thing, doctors don't necessarily shove them down your throat. Like they do, they do, well, hopefully the good ones do sort of assess you and, and give it give it to you for the right reasons. Um, it's all about kind of uh, sort of numbing yourself and, and balancing your mood. That's one thing I noticed straight away. Um, and I started on quite a low dose, dose, which was 25 milligrams a day. And in my in my worst period, I was up to 100 milligrams a day. Um, but what it does, it essentially, yeah, it, it flattens your mood. And at points where before I would have started panicking or, or I would have got like myself really sort of worked up, um, I wouldn't. Um, so in a sense it is very good for that for people who have just a natural sort of anxiety reaction to, to situations or to certain you know um, thoughts that they might be having or situations that they're in in their life um, it is very good for that but obviously there are you know there are side effects and and you know you, it shouldn't be taken lightly one of one of the one of the things I would say is when I came off them for good um and I, hopefully I'll never go back onto them this was about a year and a half ago I experienced some really bad sort of side effects like vomiting like diarrhea like waking up in the night with like sweats and like shakes and stuff like that's one thing that people need to be aware of is that if you take the commitment to go on to antidepressants um and the doctors will tell you this anyway but just be aware that there are quite severe side effects when you wean yourself off them and you can't just come off them like, Oh, I'm taking 50 milligrams of sertraline a day. I'm just going to stop. You have to go from 50 milligrams a day, try and get down to 45, then 40 and peter yourself off them and, and wean yourself off them. Otherwise you'll just have quite a severe effect because your body's used to having this quite strong chemical enter your body each day um, and, you know, perform, certain things for your body and then to suddenly starve it of that um is not good so people just need to be aware of that basically yeah absolutely man and that's so important to what you said there and I think you know if you are gonna go in for some of these types of um medications and things like that it's always always check I mean do your research on google and stuff like that but just do uh, you know make sure that you get professional um advice from that because it's so so important and so key because it can be in certain places. It can be life and death in, in, in certain things. But 100%. One, one thing that I wanted to ask you, mate, and I know that we, we've spoke about this off air again, um, the importance of medication and the stigma around it at the moment. You know, there's, there was somebody that I spoke to previously on Series 1, a girl called Ashley, and she put it so brilliantly that I'll probably mess it up. But she put it so brilliantly that if, for example, you're in a room and somebody's got a headache, you'd take a paracetamol. If someone's got a joint ache, you'd take ibuprofen. If somebody's vitamin D or vitamin C deficient, they'd take a tablet for it. But yet, like you said there about your antidepressants or something like that, if you were then to take one of those 
then there's a stigma around that because then you're thinking, well, actually, you know, why, why should I have this fear and shame around taking yeah. any sort of medication for mental health when actually everyone else is, is, you know, putting pills in them for other reasons. For other ailments. Yeah, yeah. no, hundred percent. No, and that, that's a really good point. I think the key difference between taking something for like a mental health issue rather than like something that's more traditional, you know, like taking either prophen or paracetamol is that, and it's, it's kind of a generational thing, but generations previously, they would have said, they would have turned around and said to you, oh, you know, you, you're just covering up the issue. You don't need to take that. You know, you need to just sort, you need to sort your life out. You know, you need to address your issues. Um, so I think that there's a fear that if someone was to start taking it, that people would think that they don't have their shit together. Yeah. And no one wants to appear like they don't have their shit together but the the truth is that pretty much no one has their shit together no especially now <laughs> yeah especially at the moment um so i think yeah that's 100 percent true there is a it's it's more about what are what are people going to think of me they're going to think that um it's because the whole conversation around mental health hasn't been normalized as much as as much as we'd like, you know, up until this point, which is changing 100 percent. It's getting way better. Um, the one thing I'd say is obviously there is a lot of information online about antidepressants and medication, um, as we've spoken about before. And people just need to be very careful that they are actually getting their information from the right sources. Yeah. Um, you know, go and speak to your GP. Don't believe what what you've read online or or something like that you know yeah absolutely sound advice mate um so one thing that I wanted to ask you as well mate you turned it all around and you've become somewhat of an entrepreneur I believe yeah I've always wanted to run my own business um my grandparents ran their own business my mum and my dad um after I did um, a year of sick form at school I realized that I didn't want to go to university um I just wasn't that way inclined. I was quite badly behaved at school, actually. Um, the, it, yeah, I was quite badly behaved at school. And even though I got good grades in like my GCSEs and I always enjoyed learning, traditionally it just wasn't for me. Um, so I went to college for a second year of sixth form um, to something called the Peter Jones Academy. So Peter Jones is obviously um, one of the investors on Dragon's Den. Um, and he set up, a kind of new way of learning about business in college so traditionally you would go to do a business course and you just you'd learn about business um but with this you had to present the tutors like a business plan to get onto the course um and then if you got onto the course through your business plan and um, you would then apply all the learnings throughout the year onto your business plan and you could actually pitch for investment on your idea at the end of the year. Um, so it was really cool. It was kind of like a new way of learning. So I did that and then I moved down to Brighton and I sort of worked my way up in different jobs. But on the side, I was trying to run businesses. Me and me and a friend bought a thousand pounds worth of like wholesale stock and I stored it all in my bedroom when I was about 19 and we tried to sell it online. Um, and then from there, I've set up another couple of things whilst I was um, working jobs. And then when I was living in London, um, me and a friend set up Mindful Matter, uh, which is a well-being company um, centered around mental health. We currently sell a range of, of natural supplements, but um hoping to move into a wider area, a uh, wider range of products in in sort of wellness, well-being, mental health. Um, and we've got, you know, a big, big vision for the brand. Um, but yeah, when you say about, you know, sort of turning it around, I think that's, that's one key lesson that I would take from all this is if you have gone through something traumatic or like sort of shocking, um, or it's been really tough, like you need to find a creative outlet to take your mind off it. It's like it's like when you're a kid, you know, you'd play these games and you were you would imagine that you were characters or you, that you were off in another universe or something. And it's it's such a great outlet with something like a business because you can take yourself away from the reality and the sort of pain of day to day. Be creative, be productive, um, and it provides you a kind of whole other like entity in your life, if that makes sense. Um, 
and it can be very powerful. I guess it's like with you, with, you know, your podcast and everything you're trying to do um, with your stuff. It takes you away, doesn't it? And it and it provides another outlet, um, which yeah. is really important. And you, you wake up and you're like excited to like enter your own little world. Yeah, absolutely, man. You know I think I, mean? I think for me as well, you know, <clears throat> you mentioned there about the uh, the podcast, and for me, it's been it's been so nice to to chat to so many people and release the stigma around mental health. But in such a time that we're in now, it's actually nice to meet new people. I know that it's like digitally and stuff at the uh, and 100%. all that at the minute. Well, we'll it's... be going for a beer at some point. Oh, absolutely, mate. Yeah, hundred percent. Next time I'm down in Brighton, I'll be there. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's it's just so nice, and I think, like you said there, to to have that what started as a passion project and now is growing into something that will hopefully, fingers crossed, be a career moving forward, and and you know things like that, and has opened up so many more opportunities to to find something that creative. And I know so many people that have said, you know, like, oh, I've done, I've never been, I had the time to be able to do this previously, but now I'm doing this. And I feel so much better for it. And they've started businesses yeah. from it and they've been able to do X, Y, Z. It's so, so amazing. So yeah, I think that there's been a lot of, a lot of negativity that's, uh, you know, happened and quite rightfully um, throughout, throughout the pandemic. Um, but there have been some good, you know, good news stories as well that's come out. And hopefully, you know, we're, we're examples <laughs> of that that's, that's come through. Yeah, hundred percent, man. I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, I think like it, not gonna lie, like watching your stuff, like the way you are on your Instagram and stuff, it's actually given me a bit of confidence, you know, because um, the way you project yourself is the way I want to project myself. But I get so <coughs> I get so caught up in my own thoughts and um, the negative stuff that's happened that I don't necessarily feel I'm I'm projecting like my real self, like like the comedic side of myself or you know the creative side I want to I want to do it a lot more and doing stuff like this um really helps you know just just spending time with like-minded people really yeah and I think that's the thing mate like when you know there's always that debate between Instagram and reality and and things like that and you know when you're and I, I appreciate what you said there, mate. Thank you so much for that. I, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to be me on, on Insta, like as, yeah, I love it. as I love goofy it. as I can be, but, um, yeah. but yeah, like it's, um, it's, it is that whole Instagram versus reality thing because, you know, there's, there have been, and I know that my mental health recently with the tier four lockdown, with, uh, the national lockdown, with getting series two prepped, with not having any work and things like that. I have been in the gutter, mate. Like I've been, my mental health has been awful, but Again, now that I've Sorry got, to hear that. oh, that's all right, man. Thank you so much. But it's um, it's now that I've got people like chatting to people like yourself, and I think that was that was the weirdest part is that oh, the break from series one to series two, where I, is where I saw a, a bit of a decline in my mental health. Obviously, there were other circumstances going on as well, but I think it was that communication piece, you know, because you speak yeah. to you speak to some people and you, or the same people at certain times, and you're like okay, cool. There's not like too much more like, bless them. I love my mum and dad, but it's constantly talking about the same stuff. And I'm like, right. Okay, cool. Let's, uh, let's, let's mix it up a bit, you know? So, um, so yeah, but my, I, I, I'm glad to say that now my mental health is on the up. I, I'm so glad to be back doing this. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing chatting to people like you talking to talking about mental health in such an open way, mate. Definitely, definitely, man. Um, they say variety is the spice of life, right? Exactly. Um, and that's true in what you were just saying, like learning about new people, uh, where they've come from. Like you you live in Clapham. I was, I used to go out in Clapham all the time because I was living in Stockwell. You know, you can, you can find common ground with a lot of people just by opening up the conversation. Yeah, absolutely, man. So one thing, mate, that um that I think is really important you mentioned mindful matter earlier tell us a little bit more about it you said there that you obviously deal within uh, within the supplements and things like that so what's um where is it that you see mindful matter going so I'd say long term um we so we've got the trademark for mindful matter um across like things like supplements and stuff um and we've actually got it registered for um an app so currently now we're just an e-commerce company. Um, we've got a range of supplements, which is growing. I want to, as I said before, I want to go into other other product areas um, and try and become like a proper wellness brand that like has roots in like lots of different areas of, of wellness, like 
aromatherapy, yoga, you know, just general well-being. Um, so that's kind of the plan at the moment is to is to build the product side of the business and focus on, you know, revenue. Um, but I don't know what's going to happen down the line, to be honest. Um, as I said, we've got the trademark registered for the app. I've got some ideas about um, potentially putting an app together, like a, a sort of mindfulness app. Um, but yeah, at the moment, my key focus is just sort of growing the business, um, keeping uh, the content side of the business going. We've got a blog called Mindful Minutes, um, which I'd like to keep growing, which is like a sort of um, a weekly insert of, of positivity and self-development and personal growth, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. I feel like we're in a good position, just uh, just need to keep going at it. Whether I do this forever, uh, I'm not sure. I do have other ideas that I want to work on as well. Um, I really enjoy writing. I, I do some freelance writing for another company, um, and I've got some other bits I do as well. So, yeah, just trying to manage everything um, and see where it goes. But, yeah, any any sort of promotional or marketing would be would be beneficial for sure <laughs> yeah absolutely and i just want to take a moment mate congratulations for starting it man especially in such a time where, that we're in at the minute and the fact that it's doing so well um Cheers. yeah because as i said earlier you know this this past year and a bit has been tough so as i said earlier 100%. you know to see to see something positive come out of a negative uh, is is amazing so what would you say then, mate, is is next for you? Have you got any any new business ventures, anything else that you kind of want to develop at the moment? I know you said about the the app and building out other things there, but, you know, is there anything else that you're looking forward to in the future? Yeah, not no new business ideas. I mean, this this takes up enough enough time as it is, and um, we've put a lot, of, a lot of everything into this. Um, so um, this is my key focus at the moment. Um, I'd love to keep doing more stuff like this. Um, one of my long term goals is is to get back into acting. So when I was younger, I used to I used to love acting. I um, was always doing shows at school and I did Am Dram in my local area. Um, so I'm going to start working on, on some stuff like that because I do want to be more creative um, and I do quite enjoy being like in front of the camera and and um and the whole acting side of it is something that I want to do long term. So, yeah, I think the key focus is managing my business. Um, I'm hopefully going traveling later this year. I have actually booked to go to Canada in July. Um, I just love like North America in general. Um, my mum lived out in America for, for six years in, in Manhattan. Um, so been to America loads of times and, and done some cool road trips and stuff like that. So, yeah. Key focus is keep being creative, running my business, do some traveling and um, yeah, just working on my mental health. And um, the one thing I would say, if, the, if there's anyone watching this that, yeah, as I said, has been, has been going through something similar or is struggling with chronic pain and, and not sure where to go with it all, uh, you can 100% reach out to me. Um, I'm all ears. Um, you can DM me or email me or have a call or whatever, but I'm just happy to help really. Yeah, mate. And I think, honestly, that's such a testament to you as a person. You know, the weeks and months that I've got to know you as well, you're such a lovely guy. So genuine with that as well. And fingers crossed that we all, we're all we all able to get away this year because I'm desperate. I, I was supposed to finish my traveling to Vietnam uh, last year and then obviously COVID hit. So I'm desperate to go away. I've never been to the US though. Never been to the US and Canada. I've got a lot of friends over there. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's somewhere that I want to go. Yeah. Now that Trump's out, uh, somewhere I want to go. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. I love America. Oh, wait, I, I really hope that you get to go to Vietnam. Um, I've ne I've never been to that side of the world. Um, but yeah, let's let's see what happens. My my sister still lives. Well, my brother and sister still live in London. So, um, hoping to come up sort of early summer. So let's uh, let's definitely get together. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll definitely get something on the cards. Mate, I just want to say a massive thank you for coming on the show. I really do appreciate it. Um, where is it that we can find you? Not only yourself, um, but also the details for uh, Mindful Matter as well. Yeah, 100%. So my Instagram is the Sean Bryant um, and Mindful Matters one is at Mindful Matter Official. Um, so yeah, hopefully we can tag it and um, get some more followers and, and spread the word about mental health. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Um, yeah, Sean, 
It's been an absolute pleasure, mate. I know that we had some technical issues before, <laughs> so, we're, yeah. so we're doing this again. But yeah, mate, I really appreciate your time and uh, best of luck, mate. And yeah, I, I, as I said, we're in the summer or even the winter by the time that it all comes around, we'll, we'll meet up for a beer. We'll get somewhere. 100%. No, I really appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. No worries, bro. Thank you so much. See you again soon. Cheers, man. Cheers. See ya. Bye. Thank you so much for watching this video. Make sure you hit that like, subscribe and turn on all notifications and I'll see you in the next video.